Hello, I'm delighted to be here to speak to you today about why I think psychological investigations of the peer group context are so important for helping us to understand and support the development of children and young people at school. Now, I'm a developmental psychologist, and I spend a lot of time working with and in schools. And when we think of schools, I suppose the thing that comes to mind, first of all, is the academic context the experience of students in terms of their educational achievement, teachers interacting with children in the context of their instructional activities. And that's a natural place to start. But I think that if we stop there, we miss out on a really important social context for children's development at school. And that's the peer group context. What I'm going to try and show you today is why I think the peer group context helps us understand a really complex interplay of how children act, their behavior, how children are thinking, their cognition, how children are feeling, their emotional experiences, and what's driving them. What are the goals that are actually motivating them to behave in certain ways? And that interplay, I believe, is really crucial for us. It's crucial in helping us to make sense of key developmental outcomes for children and young people at school, their mental health, their emotional adjustment, and it will take us right back to where we started, the educational achievement of children as well. What I want to try and show today is that we can weave all of those things together to actually make a difference to children's lives. So let's start right off by looking at the behavior of children, because that's, after all, what we can see. And when psychologists look at children's behavior in school contexts, you can identify a range of different types of characteristics. You can see a cluster of positive social behaviors, all the social skills that you might want to cultivate in your children. Being kind, helping others, being a good leader, resolving conflicts peacefully. All of those things we want to encourage, but of course, we don't always see those patterns coming from every child. We sometimes see more negative patterns. We see things like aggressive or disruptive behavior, the so-called acting out characteristics. Or we might see more withdrawn or socially isolated characteristics as well. Now, if our lens through which we look at the school is focused primarily on how children are getting on with their teachers in the context of classroom instruction, we might be tempted to focus only on the top right characteristics, the behavior that might disrupt learning, children who are aggressive, who are causing problems in school. And in fact, if you look at news stories in education, that's what you often see, problems with behavior in the classroom, disrupting learning. What are we going to do about these problem disruptive kids? And yet I think we need to take a step back, and we need to understand what's going on within the peer group, because the classroom and all the other parts of the school environment are deeply social places. So let's look at the peer group context within a typical classroom. This is a sociogram. It's a visual representation of how children are relating to each other within a classroom environment. These positive nominations are represented by arrows here. Children are identifying simply who they most like to hang out with. And we also get information on who they least like to hang out with. Now we can see that certain individuals within the class receive many, many positive nominations. You can see um, the green node for Sarah with tons and tons of positive nominations heading into her. Many, many children want to hang out with her. They want to spend their free time with her. They really like being with her. But there are other children, like Alex and Emily, in the top with the little black nodes. Those children receive not one single nomination. They make their nominations of who they most like to hang out with, but not one single person nominates them back positively. And in fact, we know from the data that we've got, you can see from the color coding, those children are identified as rejected because not only have they not received any positive nominations, we know they've received many, many negative nominations. Now, we could try and unpack all of these variations, which you'll find in any given classroom, in terms of behavior. We could identify, for example, what behavior patterns predict being rejected. 
And you would find, in fact, that yes, disruptive and aggressive behavior often does lead to rejection within the peer group. That social withdrawal is often associated with rejection. But I want to probe a little bit deeper. I want to think a little bit about what you need in order to figure out how people work, how groups work, how we interact with each other. When you're in a peer group, when you're interacting with other people, and this, I should say, is true for us as adults, just as much as it is for children. We'll ask ourselves questions. Why did he do that? How is she feeling? We might want to figure out, what, do I, what am I going to do in this situation? What are they going to do in this situation? What can I do to help them understand my perspective? We might think to ourselves, uh-oh, I better not say that, because that's going to really upset her. And we don't always get it right. Sometimes we do upset someone else but we didn't mean to do it. And we have to understand that sometimes that happens to us as well. And that journey of figuring out how people work, what makes people tick, what's going on inside our head and what's going on inside other people's heads is a really complex journey. And children begin that journey really early on and we need to understand that journey in order to figure out what the trajectory being followed actually involves for children. We need to figure out what the underlying processes are in order to make a difference to children's lives. And that process, as I said, you can get into right at the very beginning of children's interactions with peer groups. Here's a piece of research that I engaged with with uh, one of my former PhD students, Kay Matheson, who did a lovely program of work working with two to three-year-old children in nursery schools who were making their first forays into peer interaction just engaging with this world of connecting with other children, really for the first time properly. And what we found was that even at this very early stage, there are big differences in how children understand each other. Simple things like recognizing emotions. I'm not talking about anything that seems really complex to us now. I'm talking about happiness, sadness, feeling cross. And it turned out some children are a lot better at understanding, recognizing, and labeling those emotions than others. And that, in turn, predicted outcomes for the children. Children who are better at these things were more effective in playing in a positive, interactive way, rather than being very disruptive or being disconnected from others. They would do things like sharing toys. They would take turns. They would help others. And those qualities, of course, create a platform for learning more and more about how people work. Children's understanding of the mind, figuring out what makes people's minds work, beliefs, desires, emotions, how they link together and how they link to behavior is an ongoing task that children engage with right from the beginning in their early years and take with them through their life journey. And we have to make sense of it in the peer group. Children's theory of mind at age five, for example, in another piece of research we've been doing, is related to outcomes in terms of their social behavior. Children who are better in terms of understanding the mind end up being more cooperative. They know how other people are thinking, how other people are feeling, and they can respond accordingly. They can help, they can support. And that, in turn, provides the foundation for building successful friendships. And in this piece of research, which I've been doing with some uh, collaborators in the University of Pavia in Italy, we've been following children over several years of their primary school uh, lives. And following this journey has been fascinating because not only do we understand why we get to these differences that we saw in the sociogram, why is it that Sarah has so many positive nominations while Alex and Emily didn't, but we also begin to understand what some of the knock-on consequences might be. I mentioned before that the classroom is a deeply social place. In the classroom, in those instructional activities that I referred to at the beginning, you have to work out how to get along with other people to manage being in a group together. You have to work out how to communicate, to feel comfortable with other people. And guess what? Those skills that we've just been talking about really play a big role. And we've shown that. This is the same uh, project we've been working on in Italy. Children's theory of mind at age five, as we've seen, is related to their social outcomes, levels of peer rejection or acceptance. And those social relationships, in turn, predict something else. That's right, they predict educational outcomes as well. Children with that understanding of the social world who are better able to connect with other people, 
who are better able to engage with other people are in a stronger position to be able to access the curriculum, to engage in all those instructional activities as well. But you might ask yourself then, where do these skills come from? Where does the understanding of the mind come from? Well, there are a lot of debates about exactly what factors are involved, but one thing is for sure. We learn about these things, at least to a large extent, from the social experiences that we have. We learn about people from interacting with people. We learn about connecting with other people through the connections that we've formed in the past. So if children are experiencing high levels of rejection, like Alex and Emily, those black nodes where they didn't have any positive nominations at all, that can be a risk factor. It can be a risk factor because they're not getting the social experiences that would actually drive the progress in social understanding. They might not be able to learn, for example, about unintentional insults, working out that sometimes someone else has upset me, but you know what, they didn't mean to do it. They just put their foot in their mouth. And children have to work that out, and that's not an easy task, but it's an important task, because it means getting along in the classroom, in the playground, and beyond. And of course, if children are really struggling in a vicious cycle where they're experiencing rejection, then finding it more difficult to make more progress in social understanding, and then that generating more and more peer rejection, that can lead to a really entrenched position. And that's exactly the kind of pattern that we've seen occurring over time with some of the kids in our studies, where they're experiencing not just a few days of negative from the, negativity from the peer group, but week after week, month after month, perhaps even year after year of negativity. And of course, that takes an emotional toll. Children may experience, of course, loneliness. They're not feeling satisfied with their social life. They're feeling sad. They may be feeling anxious and worried about what other people think of them. They may be feeling scared. They may also start to lose faith in the capacity to engage with other people. They may start to say, you know what? This is too much. This world is too scary. It's a dangerous place. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be here. And a number of the children that I've worked with are children who have been so socially anxious that they won't go outside to the playground and in some cases won't choose to go to school at all. It's too much for them. And for some kids, of course, this pattern is deeply connected with their home experiences. Another of my former PhD students, Nikki Luke, has been working with children who are in the care setting, children who are living with foster carers after experiencing significant maltreatment and abuse. And foster carers have said things like this. She's not only very controlling, she's also very needy of the friendship. She's so desperate to get friends, but the neediness seems to put, put them off. She doesn't get invited to birthday parties at school. That's an indicator of the level of acceptance by the other children. So these children are experiencing a double whammy of difficulties in a very traumatic home life, followed up by real difficulties in making those social connections with the peer group which in turn leads to on to all the consequences we've talked about with the uh, um, educational achievement and potentially significant mental health outcomes. I want to step outside the school gates for a moment and think about the broader social world that children inhabit. The world that we see all around us, the media messages about what it means to be successful. And I want to show you also that for some children, particularly those children who are experiencing difficulties in school, that can be a real source of difficulty. Being perceived as popular, being thought of as socially successful, is not the same as being genuinely most liked. And yet, we, even when in the back of our heads we know it, we often conflate the two together. And children for sure do that. Children who are genuinely most liked, are seen by other kids are kind and cooperative. Those are the values that are really seen positively by other kids. That's what we like our friends to be. We like them to be cooperative and kind. But we often get misled. And we often think about, instead, the things that make someone seem popular. And those might be rather different. Those might be to do with social dominance, prominence, sometimes disruptive rather than cooperative. And guess what? we also see values being attached to physical appearance and material characteristics as well. What you own, how you look, 
What's the kind of stuff that you have? And this can be deeply misleading for children who are rejected. In one of the very large studies that we've run recently, the largest of its kind, with over a, th over a thousand kids aged between 8 and 15 years, we've been able to trace that developmental pattern over a signif significant period of children's school lives. And what you see is that the media messages that are out there are filtered through the peer group context. Because children who are rejected within their peer group, who are experiencing more depressive symptoms, who are feeling bad about themselves, get misled by those social representations of success. And they turn to consumer culture values almost as a coping strategy in order to feel better. These are the things that I need in order to be successful. Then other kids won't laugh at me. Then they won't be mean to me. But over time, you know what? Any benefits that do come from those things are short-lived because over time, they lead to more peer rejection, more depressive symptoms. But I don't want to leave you on a downer because all of these vicious cycles that I've just been talking about in the last couple of minutes can be turned to their flip side, to virtuous cycles. I've done a lot of work in schools based around interventions to try and change the story for children. And we can really do that. Materialistic values we know have negative impacts in school. They lead to a greater performance goal orientation where they focus on the product of learning rather than the process of learning lower levels of persistence, and declining exam performance. But we can turn this around. In schools, our intervention strategies have focused on promoting social and emotional aspects of learning. And when those strategies are woven into the fabric of the whole school community, when it's not just one teacher or one set of people who are engaging with this, but all the stakeholders in the school, all the staff, all the kids, then we really see benefits. We see a more positive social and emotional ethos rated by the kids and the staff. And we also see not the children not just experiencing better social experience, not just experiencing better social interactions, more positive relationships with others, but we also see, guess what? Better attainment results and better attendance at school as well. So there's a wonderful interplay of how children think feel, and engage with each other. And if we choose to focus on that peer group context and understand what's going on when children are getting on with each other and also when they're falling out with each other, we can really do wonderful things to make a difference to children's lives. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>